Good morning. Hi, this is our first Oculoplastics case presentation grand rounds. Thanks for everybody who's here today. Um, we have three cases. We selected these cases so that they would have aspects of general ophthalmology and oculoplastics um, throughout them so that everyone could comment at every stage. So uh, let's have the anybody who wants to review the cases, they're on the wall. And Dr. Jose, would you like to start with the first case? Okay, good morning. I'm um, gonna present a case that we had at the VA. Some of you read the timeline on the wall. I'm gonna present the chronicle that was this gentleman's uh, case, unfortunately. So, uh, patient DC, he's an 85-year-old gentleman presenting with eye pain in his left eye. Uh, he, his past uh, ophthalmic history had an uncomplicated cataract surgery in the 1990s. Um, he had subsequent cataract surgery in his left eye. Uh, in 2010, which was complicated by, complicated by a posterior catheter tear, a three-piece sulcus uh, IOL was placed at that time. <coughs> also had a history of childhood trauma in the right eye and resultant branch retinal artery occlusion. Also has dry eye syndrome and some moderate non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Uh, pretty complicated past medical history that we see frequently, uh, including diabetes, end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis um, several times per week. Also a history of hairy cell leukemia that was treated with rituximab, sarcoidosis, hypertension, and several other uh, past medical uh, problems. Uh, no ophthalmic disease in his family, uh, no significant social history. He's on several chronic medications for his diabetes, uh, lung disease, thyroid disease, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so like I mentioned, in 2010, he had a complicated cataract surgery. A three-piece lens was placed in the sulcus. He had a good outcome afterwards, 2025, uncorrected in his left eye after surgery. So we saw him about three years after that surgery. He came into our clinic with left eye pain, subjective bulging of that eye, and also flashes in his vision. Um, at that time, he was 2050 in uh, the right eye, 2030 in the left eye that he was complaining about. Uh, he did not have any significant proptosis. Uh, his intraocular pressure was normal, both eyes at 15, normal pupils and motility. What we found that day, he did have some lower lid laxity, scleral show, some dry eye symptoms, um, the findings on his cornea. Uh, also, he had some endothelial pigment de deposit on his left uh, endothelium. Uh, and also, we saw this inferior subluxation of his left uh, lens. We thought maybe that's where the pigment was coming from. Uh, so at that time, we just decided to treat his exposure keratopathy. We also sent him to our oculoplastics clinic for an ectropion uh, evaluation repair. Uh, at that time, we saw him and just kind of bumped up his uh, treatment for dry eye, started him on cyclosporine, uh, and, de and decided to wait on any further surgical intervention. Um, he did not return to clinic after we'd asked him to, however. So we did see him about nine months or 11 months later. He came to the ER and then up to our clinic. He was complaining of cloudy vision in his left eye for about a month. It had worsened over the past week. Uh, he's also seeing some red specks in his vision. He had quite a bit of pain. Um, at that time, uncorrected was 2070. His pressure was up to 27 in the left eye. With quite a few iris translumination defects. Again, the sublux IOL, uh, two plus pigment in his anterior chamber, and a small layered hyphema inferiorly. Uh, at that time, we just treated him with uh, steroids and intraocular pressure lowering agents, uh, plus plegia for his hyphema. And then we decided to have him come back um, shortly to evaluate to see if we need to reposition that IOL if that's what was causing this uh, hyphema. Uh, came back a few days later, had recurrent pain, of course. Um, his visual acuity dropped even further to 20 over 150. Pressure was still high. Hyphema had resolved, and we also noted a vitreous hemorrhage in that eye uh, on his dilated exam. Um, we thought maybe 
This might have been a little bit too early for a steroid response, but we stopped the steroids to try to see if that would help lower its pressure, continue to mon COSOP. Uh, so I just want to ask the audience, you know, maybe from an anterior segment perspective, what would you do next? These are some options I'd propose. Um, anybody have any ideas what you would do at this time for a gentleman that has hyphemas, pigment dispersion in his uh, anterior chamber, um, recurrent pain and pressure spikes, and a subluxed IOL in the sulci. Anybody guys? Any residents have any ideas what they would want to do at this time? Dag? <laughs> Good. Okay. <laughs> knowing, the, knowing the patient, yeah. Okay, somebody that doesn't know the patient. Um, what about Russell? So that's not what we did, but I like that idea. So um, we saw him about a month later. Vision was still decreased from his baseline. Pressure had improved a little bit. So we actually scheduled him for IOL exchange and a, a pars plantar vitrectomy due to his vitreous hemorrhage. Um, <coughs> we also thought because he had his posterior capsule violated, I don't, on his original op report, he just had a limited anterior vitrectomy. So we thought maybe get rid of the rest of that vitreous um, at the same time. Also, some of these cases, when you go in and the lens that we're exchanging, we just want to have the retina service there with the ports in just in case the lens falls back. So that option available. Uh, he missed his surgery. We actually just canceled his surgery because he showed up to the OR that morning with blood sugar in the 600s. Um, vision uh, at that, that day, 20 over 150. Pressure's back up to 35. He'd been on Diamox for a very long time trying to control this pressure. His drops was just not cutting it. Uh, we rescheduled him for surgery combined with uh, PPV. Um, so <coughs> surgery happened about a month later. Finally, once we got it rescheduled, he had an AC IOL placed along with the vitrectomy. His post-op uh, vision was light perception only. Pressure was 18. He also had a vitreous hemorrhage, which, which was just observed and hopes was just cleared after surgery. Uh, about a week later, he was still light perception. He had a 50% hyphema hemorrhage coming out of the wound. We thought at that time he was likely rubbing his eye very vigorously and there was blood in the sutures and um, we uh, advised him to wear a shield at all times. He kind of had a history of like, chronic eye rubbing and, and poking at his eyes as well. So a month later, still light perception, pressure still up, has a hyphema still. He's uh, like a hemodialysis patient, chronic thrombocytopenia, platelet count of 50. So we thought, you know, maybe if we can get his platelet count up, this will help, you know, so he doesn't have any recurrent bleeds. Uh, we talked to Hemoc about this. They thought that his counts were stable. They weren't too excited about doing a platelet transfusion, given that they don't last very long, but they obliged us. We gave him a couple units of platelets. Um, a few days later, he was seen by, the was seen by the resident on call with pain, pressure of 62. Uh, he had an AC tap, pressure was down to 17 after the tap. Um, a few days later, still uh, light perception, pressure still up, another tap. He did, was noted at that time to have some corneal blood staining. So next option, what do we do? Do we wash this? <coughs> Any other ideas? You guys probably know what we did. So this time, we gave him a couple units of platelets and did an AC washout. After surgery, his, he was hand motions, pressure was still up. Um, we followed his pressure for several several weeks, and he still had a persistent elevated pressure at 29. Um, so, do you want to do any more surgery on this guy? He seems like he's just being getting worse and worse and worse. Um, we opted to do something else, so we scheduled for an IOL exchange in the left eye. So, um, this is kind of where things go downhill even further for this gentleman. He had an iris fixated eye well placed. The AC lens was removed. He had a large wound uh, in the cornea. Um, post-op day one, he was stable. He was hand motions um, or counting fingers uh, post-op day one. I saw him the next day. He had um, recurrent pain. Uh, we thought it was probably just post-surgical. His epithelium was broken down a little bit. So we placed a bandage contact lens. 
four, four days after surgery, he had even worsening pain, headache. He presented with no light perception vision. His pressure was finally down to 11. Um, but a B scan showed posterior segment inflammation, choroidal detachments. Um, he was actually seen at the VA first that morning. And at that time, he had fiber in his anterior chamber. And he had what was described by the resident, kind of a white collection of uh, material that was coming posterior to the lens forward. He was sent to the Moran. and. You know, within three hours, when Dr. Bell saw him, he had a total hypopia. So it was a really rapid progression of this uh, infection here. He was uh, urgently taken to the operating room for a tap and inject. He was actually done to the anterior chamber, given that he was vitrectomized and had an AC lens, given that this is a single chamber eye. They didn't want to go back to the back with no view. Uh, he was also started on oral Leviquin, topical Vigamox. Uh, and like I, I said, he was given vancomycin, ceftazidine, and preserved free dexamethasone. Uh, next day, his culture drew initially uh, two plus gram positive cocci. He's also noted to have lit lit edema and erythema that day. Here's his B scan. You can see these, these choroidal detachments, significant debris in the posterior segment of the eye. This was uh, done at the VA, so the same day he had the tap and inject. Here's a picture of his eye when he got to. I don't know if you took this one, Stag, or if this was when Jim Bell saw him. That was actually a couple days after. Oh, a couple days after. OK. So you can see this total hypopion here, really thinning of the cornea, distortion of the corneal surface, really injected, lit, lit erythema, edema, kind of stretching of these sutures that we placed after doing the uh, scleral suture, uh, iris fixated IOL. <coughs> a few days later, he's still no light perception. I felt very soft palpation. Uh, still had lit edema and erythema. His cultures grew back. Uh, staph was susceptible to vancomycin. At that time, we re-injected him with vancomycin and dexamethasone. Uh, we continued to follow him you know, every day or every other day. Sensitivities finally came back that was MRSA. As suspected, he was a carrier of that. Um, so still no light perception with a total hypopion. Uh, his you know, exam looked basically unchanged. Uh, his pain did start to improve, uh, however, uh, we did start to have discussions with him about removing the eye. <coughs> we did consult infectious disease to see if he needed to be on um, heavier uh, systemic antibiotics. Uh, we, they got in to see him a couple days later. They were concerned for orbital cellulitis given the appearance of his lids uh, and periorbital tissues. Um, so he was actually admitted to the, to the hospital for a renally dosed IV vancomycin. Um, so any ideas of what you would want to do next? You're following this. Intraocular infection seems like it's spreading. Uh, anything else you'd want to know from the resident perspective, what you do on call? Dr. Bird. Yeah, I agree. So we kind of danced around getting a CT scan, and eventually it was actually an MRI was obtained. Um, actually, three days later, after we'd saw, seen him in clinic and was concerned about this, the MRI just showed some pre and post septal fat stranding, thickening of the sclera. It showed all the intraocular um, debris and choroidal detachments. Uh, actually, the radiologist also noted some extraocular muscle fat stranding um, all the way back to the uh, orbital apex. So he was uh, kept in the hospital for a couple days discharged on IV vancomycin until we could definitively manage this abscess that was basically in his eye. Uh, here's some pictures. There's a T2 uh, flare. You can see some hyperintensity <coughs> all the way back to the orbital apex. Debris inside the globe here that we saw on the B scan. Same thing with this flare image. Um, just a lot of debris intraocularly and fat straining pre and post septally. So uh, we saw him about four or five days later in oculoplastics clinic. Um, after we talked about the potential for him losing the eye, he had severe lid edema, thinning of the cornea. His eye was very, very injected. He was actually taken urgently to the operating room that day for an enucleation without any implant placement. Uh, the orbit was, uh, the operative report didn't mention uh, any really debridement of the orbit. However, vancomycin was uh, vigorously irrigated into the orbit. Uh, we did place a conformer at that time. And then we readmitted him to the hospital for further IV vancomycin, which he was kept in the hospital for two more days. 
uh, infectious disease continued to follow him, and they discharged him on PO doxycycline just for a week. Didn't feel any further need for vancomycin, given that the nidus of the infection. Uh, we saw him about a week after the surgery. Um, his pain was actually much, much improved. No sign of spread or return infection. Conformer looked like it was holding in place okay. Family and patient were extremely, extremely happy just to be done with this kind of ordeal he was going through and all. Um, we did obtain a post-operative MRI scan, which just showed post-surgical staining, uh, showed surgical changes uh, in residual swelling, no further sign of infection. Uh, and clinically, he, that was, you know, uh, went along with what we saw clinically. So I just wanted to talk quickly about panoplomitis and then open it up to discussion of anybody in the audience. So not really common to see this. We see more endophthalmitis, but panoplomitis, the true definition is inflammatory process involving an ocular cavity with all coats of the eye involved, T nodes, capsule, and surrounding orbital tissues. You will see orbital signs with this, um, not just um, you know, decreased orbit like you'd see with uh, endophthalmitis. From the endophthalmitis vitrectomy study, typically occurs two to 11 days postoperatively. 94% of the uh, bacteria is isolated in the EVS study were gram positive. Uh, most commonly coag coagulated negative staph, the staph epi, uh, commonly found on the skin. 14% uh, in that study were staph aureus, like our gentleman had, and then um, goes down to strep, enterococcus, and gram-negative gram rods. Um, the incidence after, this is just after surgery with IOL placement, estimated between uh, about one in 1,000 to one in 2,500 um, uh, incidence there. Um, Things you want to glean from the EVS is that if they do have LP light perception or worse vision, you want to proceed initially with a vitrectomy with injection of antibiotics instead of just a tap and inject. They do have a better outcome if you do uh, proceed with that treatment. Uh, and then also glean from the EVS study is that there's no added benefit to systemic IV antibiotics. Um, however, I put a little asterisk here because the choice of antibiotics in the EVS study was amikacin and ceftazidine. Those don't really have good coverage for uh, coag negative staph, which is the most of the isolates that they, they found. And also amikacin doesn't have great intravitreal uh, penetration, doesn't cross, cross the eye blood, brain, uh, eye blood barrier very well. So maybe uh, with newer antibiotics like we have PO moxifloxacin now and gadifloxacin, those, you know, that's the outcomes of that study. Some controversies. Um, Regarding this case, so we still don't know about the role of systemic antibiotics. Uh, recent review in 2013 still didn't uh, propose yes or no definitively whether uh, systemic antibiotics were necessary. Like I said, oral uh, moxifloxacin and gadifloxacin are now available, kind of do away with the trouble of uh, IV dosing these patients. They do have uh, vitreal penetra penetration is very good, and they're actually very well tolerated, so the risk-benefit profile there is kind of in the patient's favor. Um, the st most of the studies that do look at systemic antibiotics, they look for benefit to the globe, not necessarily prophylaxis of intracranial spread or orb orbital spread. So really, most of the studies are looking at, you know, does this patient actually recover vision or not, not does this save their life from an intracranial spread. Um, there's also some, a couple reports in the literature of meningitis following postoperative endophthalmitis. Uh, this one study by Owen a few years ago did start the patient on PO Cipro. However, they was a resistant organism, so they did develop meningitis that was treated. The patient survived. And then another study by Ali, um, they didn't put, in, put the patient on any systemic antibiotics, and the patient uh, had developed um, meningitis from staph pneumonia, or strep pneumo, excuse me. Uh, a couple more controversies I just wanted to bring up and then have some discussion about is and nucleation versus evisceration in this case. Um, a lot of the reports and many surgeons out there in the literature say that they prefer an evisceration and endophthalmitis versus panophthalmitis. Um, there was one textbook I came across with a little blurb that said, do the cut ends of the optic nerve uh, after nucleation provide an avenue for intracranial spread of, of bacteria that's already seated in the orbit uh, or in the sclera? Um, and then if with uh, e Evisceration, is there a risk of exposure, extrusion, or dissemination of infection um, just because of the tissues are friable and infected? Uh, there's a report in 1987 by Afrin who was retrospective review of 165 patients. They were nucleated for endophthalmitis, and they did not have any cases of intracranial spread afterwards. 
Um, and they thought that their conclusion was that in the modern era of antibiotics, now we have uh, good agents to treat these, these bacteria, et cetera, that endothelitis is not really felt to be a contraindication of nucleation anymore. Um, and in 2005, this is just uh, basically uh, finding out if a primary implant is okay in a patient that has an active infection. ABLE in 2005 presented 22 patients with either endophthalmitis or panophthalmitis, and they placed a primary implant after an enucleation at the same time of surgery, so not a staged procedure. Um, they did not have any persistent orbital cellulitis or cases of meningitis. Uh, they placed 11 silicone implants and 11 hydroxyapatite. They did have two extrusions with the silicone, but no extrusions with the hydroxyapatite implants. Um, they did conclude, though, in highly virulent organi organisms like Pseudomonas that can persist uh, in the intrascleral lamella, they did feel enucleation over evisceration was, was indicated. But all their, all their patients, they did enucleation, so they, and they had good outcomes with them. So that's just kind of a uh, point of discussion I wanted maybe some of our experts to discuss. Um, so a few things, what could have been, been done differently in this case? Um, multiple surgeries, multiple complications, eventual loss of the eye, hospitalizations, large costs to the family um, and to the patient. Um, could this, should this patient have been eviscerated versus enucleated? Um, should he have had a primary orbital implant placed at the time? Um, just as an aside, he's doing really well now. Um, his conformer has been resized and it's fitting well doesn't have an implant in there. So um, maybe knowing what you know now, you may not want to do any more surgery on this family. So any thoughts from the audience? Dr. Olson. So <coughs> not necessarily in the, in the Oculus Live that the question was to be there, but it, it is pretty interesting what we're dealing with uh, from an infectious standpoint. Uh, there's a, a little paper that did not get published at the end of the journal. I, I thought it was actually a pretty good paper, but um, I, I first saw it, but it was interesting. Uh, at the time of cataract surgery, the culture of the osteops was to see what, what is the standard flora that we would have in the bed. Uh, and, uh, we have the highest incidence of persistence of any patient coming in on this, much less than any place in the country. So 50% standard now are Merkel, which is not just methicillin, it's what's called in the multi-specialty oncology. Uh, and particularly well with Fort Portland. So the correlation you get is just rare, and there are some other areas that were particularly high. What, does anybody know what's the highest correlation in the, the, the number of uh, Merkins going once or twice in an individual? What's the, what's the correlation with the general population and the, and the, and the level of Merkel? Is there? What did, what did you say? So that used to be the old saying. There's no correlation in that case. It was more likely not in that case than in other cases. It's the poultry market. Poultry. poultry. Thank <laughs> you. 
still there. Yeah, you, in fact, the issue of that, that, that comment, I mean, this idea that you're going to observe the emotion of people over there, two-thirds of our patients are going to observe the emotion. It's not people <coughs> in the hospital. It's people are coming up out of the out of room five. And, uh, you know, obviously, they don't feel connected. Right. So you bring up a good point. This gentleman did not have intracameral antibiotics after his last IOL exchange, the iris fixated one. Given his history of chronic rubbing and pulling at his eyes, his MRSA carrier status, and that might have been a, a good step to take after surgery, especially with compliance with drops. And you know, they had a, a leaky lung at all? Didn't have a leak. I mean, we sutured it really well because it was a big one. We had to take that AC lens out. Um, and Does everybody here remember? that I know of, no. Uh, no, he did not have an APD that was ever noted. He was, most of the times he was dilated in his other eye, did have a lot of trauma and injury to it. So I think the assessment of the pupils there wasn't necessarily probably accurate. Um, I don't know the exact reason for that. I didn't, I wasn't there for that portion of the case. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I think it's surgeon preference maybe at the time. Talk to him about that. Doctor Anderson. Thank you. 
So uh, this case, it, it brings about a lot of topics. One is, when did he first develop endophthalmitis? Was it the last case after the iris fixated lens when he was brought to the Moran that single day? Was it before that? This is an, immu an immunocompromised patient that has constantly been describing pain and constantly been having multiple, multiple surgeries to try and get him to a place, but we're actually causing more harm with every surgery, as Dr. Jost was explaining, every single surgery that we're doing, we're causing more and more harm, and recognizing that this man has been sitting in the hospital for the past month with NLP vision while on IV antibiotics, but he's immunocompromised in the hospital, horrible place to get an another infection, and now he has panophthalmitis that could spread to his brain, we need to get the eye out or relieve the infection. So involving oculoplastics early, I saw him the first day that I enucleated him, and that was within three or four hours. So when you get, when you get ophthalmitis, you can talk to the patients about getting an enucleation or evisceration, but you really should involve oculoplastics that day. Don't wait and let them sit for a while. So that's our take home point. But Dr. Oberg, do you have any points about evisceration and nucleation, panophthalmitis that you've encountered? That was just kind of an old textbook that they, just a little blurb on. I couldn't find any references where they where they got that from. But I think maybe that's older way of thinking before the you know, modern era of antibiotics. And you know, one of those papers was from the 80s, and they thought that you know this enucleation is, is a safe procedure with all the good antibiotics they have nowadays. And that was you know 30 almost 30 years ago that they wrote that. Yeah, we were we were debriding. I think Trent, you were in on that case. We were debriding, we were irrigating, we were caught, <laughs> we, we were trying to find tissue that was actually gonna bleed, and then we, I did not make a specific attempt to cauterize the nerve, no, but we were trying to cauterize a lot of stuff back there. Dr. Anderson? Thank you. Oh, we have another case, Dr. Richards. <laughs> Dr. Jose had no association with the endophthalmitis. He's an excellent <laughs> surgeon. <laughs> the man is, uh, was rubbing. There were a lot of social factors. His daughter was a nurse. She kept bringing him in every week, apparently, and would insist that he be fully evaluated with uh, all, you know, all uh, urgency, just dropping in at the VA, and I think that there were a lot of social factors that were going on as well. He did bring in 2,000 donuts, though, the day after he took his eye out, so <laughs> that's why his blood sugar was 600. <laughs> uh, Jim said that he did that, too, like, for his cataract surgery, but he like, he had two dozen donuts and Jim said, hey, thanks. He went to grad. He's like, no, one of them was for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, all right, all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, so here's another devastating inf infection. Um, oops, right here. 
So um, this just happened recently. This was a 57-year-old drunk homeless guy that was found down um, and had a big cut in his eyelid. And the, the uh, police found him. They brought him in to the ER. He was seen uh, on a Friday morning. Uh, they didn't know how long he had been out or when the, the cut occurred. And so he was, and he, he didn't know himself, he didn't know how it happened or why it happened. He just knew he was drunk and he woke up out of his wheelchair and they brought him in and he was still kind of intoxicated when, when he was uh, seen the next morning. Really no past medical history or surgical history. The social history is that he's homeless, um, current smoker and drink whatever he could get his hands on. And I'll kind of go through it a little bit quickly since this was on the wall. Um, so that was uh, his exam at the time. It was pretty unremarkable. Um, between the two eyes, everything looked okay, um, except for he had a little bit of limitation of movement in the left eye, and then he had a higher pressure in the left eye. Uh, so he was given some Diamox, and the pressure went right back down. And there was no, uh, it didn't look like there was uh, any concern for a retrovulvar hemorrhage, or there, and there were no fractures on his scan. But this was his, his uh, eyelid laceration. It was noted um, that the septum had been violated, and that there was some orbital fat kind of extruding out there. So uh, the case was run by uh, and staffed and, and it was determined that we had just close, that the, close the wound, uh, clean it out thoroughly with some betadine and close it, make sure that all the fat had been, um, that wasn't still extruding out and then send him home with some, some, uh, let's see, was that? Sorry, I think I put the wrong scan up on this one, but um, this is the wrong scan for that, sorry. So they, they just closed him up and they just wanted to follow up and just make sure that the wound was healing okay and then wanted him to have an eval for glaucoma. And that's about, and then he came in three days later, had increasing swelling, soreness of the eye, the vision had decreased. His vision was now, went from 20-40 to count fingers. Uh, he now could no longer move his eye. Uh, he did not have an APD by reverse, though. The pupil wasn't reacting, but three different uh, MDs looked at that pupil and was determined that there was not an APD at that time. Had a lot of chemosis and injection, and actually bilaterally. Um, and then the, the surface of the cornea just looked terrible. And the dilated exam was unremarkable. So this was the picture when he returned three days later. Uh, it just looks like this big gob of pus, um, and he just really, the eye just looked nasty. Um, so at this point I kind of proposed like what would you do and anybody who read over the case any suggestions of kind of what they would do at this point. He was in triage clinic. It was about 530. <laughs> um, I think it was like the weekend right before Christmas. <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly, and that's that was what was done. You know, we need to send him to the ER. Let's get some scans and get some cultures. So then the resident cleaned him up in the ER, and come to find out that wasn't pus. Um, as he was trying to clean it out, the pus hurt to remove, and he figured out that wasn't pus. That was his fat. Um, and so got the got the CT scan. At this time, the the concerning thing was, you know, it looked a little bit more extensive inflammation, kind of a orbital cellulitis picture, but the, the concerning thing was that there was air within the left cavernous sinus. Um, and that kind of fit with the picture of now no longer being able to move his eye. Didn't have an APD yet, uh, but he also, he also didn't have any V1 sensation. He did have V2 though. Um, and so this is where the scan, you can kind of see that air in the cavernous sinus there and, and just kind of the orbit just looking pretty ratty and, and infected. So then we got an MRI, MRA uh, to further evaluate this hair in the cavernous sinus. And this is where you could see the diffusion and uh, restriction of the abscess that he had this, uh, in his orbit. So he was taken to the OR. He was actually started on IV antibiotics, taken to the OR. Um, and I guess the recurring theme is I'm involved in these cases at some point in the <laughs> OR. Uh, so I didn't do too much, but. The abscess was drained. Uh, we were, I mean, as soon as you open it up, it was just, just gobs of pus that was coming out. And so we, we thoroughly irrigated it um, with saline, ANSEF, and VANC. 
Uh, the wound was left open to drain. Try to remove any necrotic tissue. Uh, but the, the good thing is that the tissue was vascularized. It didn't look like it was a neck bash type uh, infection. The, the tissue was pretty well vascularized. And then we sent uh, cultures, obviously. So one day post-op, uh, I, th I believe this was Christmas Eve now, um, went and saw him and he just said, well, ever since I woke up, I haven't been able to see anything. My vision was the same after the surgery, but since I woke up, just nothing. And now he had a very large APD. Still couldn't move his eye around. Um, and so he repeated the MRI, the MRA, and the inflammation was pretty stable. There wasn't a new abscess and there was no cavernous sinus thrombosis that was noted. So we, we thought, well, now it looks like he's got, uh, got more of an orbital apex syndrome. Um, we'll continue the IV antibiotics, obviously, but he just has so much inflammation that let's try to see if we can give him some steroids and see if that could possibly help. Uh, in the meantime, his culture grew up three plus MSSA and beta hemolytic strep. So then the antibiotics were, were targeted and switched to ceftriaxone. So this is about three days post-op. Um, looks a lot better. It looks terrible still, but a lot better than it had been looking. Um, and he was in much less pain at about three days. And it was about this time that we stopped the steroids, and then he was discharged a couple of days, a few days later, um, on Augmentin uh, to finish a 14-day course, and then he followed up. And this was his follow-up exam here in the clinic. Um, still couldn't move his eye, completely totic, uh, but no longer infected and inflamed. And the, the other interesting thing I forgot to mention was that he had this raging infection, and the highest his white count ever got was about 10. Um, and he was never febrile. He was never septic. Um, he never met any of the criteria. And so... It was kind of interesting because he had no past medical history other than alcoholism. So, so I kind of was, I was, it made me think um, in all the eyelid lacerations that I've seen on, on call and, and taken care of, and very, very rarely have I ever started oral antibiotics, uh, usually only if it's a dog bite. Um, and so I kind of wondered, well, are we doing our patients a disservice? Should we do prophylactic antibiotics with eyelid lacerations? Obviously, this isn't just your routine eyelid laceration, but in general, I kind of wanted to look into that and see if there's anything. And, and most of the literature really only talks about dog bites as far as eyelid lacerations or facial lacerations with antibiotics and, and culture. And so um, just an interesting time. I won't go through everything here, but the... The big thing that I, that I, or the interesting point that I found was that one study, I think it had about 65, 70 patients where they randomized um, in a dog bite. If the patient had been um, treated within eight hours of injury, they were randomly assigned between uh, an antibiotic or a placebo. And they didn't see any difference at that. But if it was after eight hours, then they did see a, an increased infection rate. Um, and then just kind of quickly with orbital cellulitis, we know most commonly is from uh, sinusitis, but trauma, and some people recommend doing prophylactic antibiotics even with uh, orbital fractures, just because you can then have an entry point into the orbit and you can get, a lot of times you get kind of a sinusitis after that and it, and it enters in. And, and so a lot of people will recommend just prophylactic oral antibiotics even with um, orbital fractures. So kind of some of the conclusions that I drew from this case, looking through some of the different cases I've had during residency and then kind of reading up is what I would probably do going forward is be a little bit more aggressive in starting prophylactic antibiotics. Maybe not necessarily if it's a clean laceration. We know the story and it's, it's, it comes together nicely and you can clean it out. But if the septum's violated or the treatment was delayed, more than eight hours, you don't know how long it took. Um, if it was a dirty laceration, like if it was a dog bite, or like in this condition, he was homeless, we had no clue what caused the laceration, and we didn't know how long it was either. Uh, poor follow-up and then unclean living conditions. And then the next thing is the immunosuppression. It's not just your typical immunosuppression, you know, chemotherapy or, or whatnot, but um, in his case, his alcoholism had definitely uh, caused him to be immunosuppressed, and he never really mounted a response. 
Um, and so these are just kind of things to maybe think about going forward and not just uh, just kind of get into the habit of just cleaning it, um, tacking it together and, and putting some ointment on it and, and then following up. Uh, but I just kind of wanted to open it up to a discussion point to see if any of the other attendings or, or residents or faculty have, you know, what their experience has been with, have they s ever seen a, a terrible infection like this from a, an eyelid laceration or do you see, you know, cellulitis after a, a have you seen, you know, multiple cases of cellulitis after an eyelid laceration and, and would you, like, what's your stance with oral antibiotics and whatnot? Yeah, Kim. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't think he did. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Those are great points. Thanks, Kim. Yeah, appreciate it. Dr. Warren? Yeah, he did. He did. And that so the original one, sorry, and I made a mistake. I realized when I was going through it that I put the follow-up one twice. Um, but the report on the original one was just periorbital soft tissue swelling, no fractures, um, kind of some inflammatory surrounding with the fat. So is that, is that, if that was your pilot, would that change your thinking to accept that that was a, a normal laceration? No, his septum was violated. I mean, this was not your, con not your typical eyelid laceration that I've seen. I've never actually taken care of an eyelid laceration that involved a septum. All the ones I've seen on call have just been simple, you know, superficial lacerations. And so, um, and yeah. That, would that be sort of a, yeah. a decision you can free you as far as maybe if it's clear or not if it's an eyelid laceration, maybe we can treat it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's why I liked your point about just giving him ANCEP in the ER because, I mean, we could have sent him home with antibiotics and who knows if he takes them or not. But at least he got something, you know, there. A couple, a couple of days in the hospital or an IV, you might have had, yeah. you know, changed the trajectory of what's going on. I don't, I mean, it's too much of this, but. Yeah, in hindsight. Yeah, but, yeah. you know. Yeah, Julie. Kind of, 
so there are a couple papers I read of basically just kind of reports of some of the or, of orbital cellulitis that they've had after patients that have had uh, orbital fractures, and so they just kind of recommended from you know a handful of cases that they had had during their experience to to start prophylactic antibiotics. A lot of people have found, uh, I mean, in, in this case, we do know that it's not a unique effect, but it's actually a pretty remarkable effect in the other one. Yeah. And uh, these people uh, have gone across there and uh, gone and had uh, significant hy hypodiagnosis of what happened to you, Mr. Fox, and the treatment was, you know, you may have come in, and even though you may get this blood level in there, so it's not a very normal exposure in the lab, but when they yeah. say, yeah, I know you need to get this treatment. Dr. Anderson. Yeah. Great. Uh, Dr. Oberg has a case, and um, we're running short on time, but I really wanted to thank Dr. Anderson and Kian and Dr. Oberg for coming. Uh, it's really helpful to have community. Uh, come in and give us support and also be able to teach um, a little bit during these. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Hey, guys. So we'll just kind of sp speed through to cut to the meat of everything, okay? No worries. So this is a 45-year-old Caucasian man who's had a calasian in his right upper lid for several months. He's been treated with a couple of different injections and incision and drainages by his uh, primary <laughs> ophthalmologist. Afterwards, he's, he does good for a while. They come back. They always seem to be kind of in the same area, but they think maybe it's, it's moving you know, around a little bit. And so he got sent to me because he's like, I cut in last time, and it was just kind of fibrous. I didn't really get a whole lot out of it and wanted to see what you think about it. Um, so no real medical history, um, no significant family history. When I talked to him, he's like, yeah, I think that overall things are heading in the right direction. I'm just tired of it. Can you make this go away for good? Um, so in his right upper eyelid, he has a chronic chalazia, and he has bilateral meibomian gland disease, blepharitis, a pretty classic kind of chalazian setup. Um, there's a single plug meibomian gland, and it seems like it's right <coughs> under the calasian. So I don't know how well that shows up here. So there's a little point erythema kind of right there, and then he has just kind of diffuse 
swelling in that whole area. And there's also Kenalog in here at the time. It doesn't show up well in the picture, but there's even some sort of anterior Kenalog from an, an anterior, a more anterior injection of steroid. Um, so it looked at it. <coughs> Still looked like, you know, it, it was flipped the lid. There was a little bit of a scar from a, a prior injection or an uh, incision and drainage. So put a little steroid in it, probed into the mybomian, mybomian gland orifice. It was actually able to milk out some mybum by putting you know, a Q-tip on each side and kind of rolling. And said, let's, let's see what that does for you. Uh, comes back four weeks later, he's like, yeah, it was good for two weeks, but now it's, now it's there. And so then we say, all right, let's, we're tired of messing with this. Let's see if, make sure that this is just a calasian. So we, we took him to the OR and inverted the lid. And this was something I wanted to talk about, which we, we found in, an, in a, an older paper, but it's a really s a nice technique for a chronic calasian that you want to excise. You still put the clamp on, flip it, and then with your blade, you just make a conjunctival incision. And then you can dissect with Westcott scissors and free up the conjunctiva. And then you have the exposed tarsal plate. And we're able to actually just excise the tarsus instead of just doing like another incision and, uh, incision and drainage, which gets rid of the calasian and also gets you some tissue. In his case, the conjunctiva that was overlying the affected part of the tarsus was, was pretty fibrotic and scarred. So we wound up having to take more of the conjunctiva than we would have liked to but we wanted to get some for biopsy regardless. So that pathology returned as CIN with marked atypia. Um, this was done in an outside hospital. We had it sent to Dr. Mamelis just so that he could lay eyes on it because we wanted to make sure this wasn't a sebaceous cell carcinoma. And the margins are involved. So he's, he's healing well, the calasian's gone. Um, we start talking that, you know, once your eyelid heals, we're considering doing a course of topical uh, alpha interferon therapy to help get rid of the CIN uh, because it's hard to, hard to chase CIN in a, in a lid because they can't give you frozen sections on it and you don't want to just keep tearing out huge chunks of conjunctiva to try to get the margins cleared. And so there, there's where we were. And then, so the plan was to, we'll give them treatment kind of monitor him clinically for six months do a, a repeat biopsy in that area. Three weeks later, he comes back and says, he's back again. And so now we're like, all right, this is, this is just not right. Um, and we just need to go back to the OR, get rid of this thing, get more tissue. So we take a, a fairly sizable wedge, send that. And that comes back now as sebaceous cell carcinoma, well differentiated within one millimeter of the borders. The CIM with marked atypia is still present. So now we have a sebaceous cell carcinoma. The tarsus is clear, but we still have the CIN, and it's really close to the borders. So now we have to kind of go down the sebaceous cell carcinoma <coughs> route. We get conjunctival map biopsies. We take a bigger wedge to make sure that the margins are in deer are indeed cleared. And then we also get um, ENT involved to help us out with the sentinel lymph node biopsy. And so this is basically the map of where we took the conjunctival map biopsies from the globe. We also took several from the palpebral conj as well. Take a bigger wedge. Anybody work with that blue stuff before? Anybody know what that is? It's, what's that? It's a methylene blue. And so at the start of the case, we injected the lid with the methylene blue. And then by the time ENT is ready to do their sentinel lymph node biopsy, the lymph nodes are, are popping positive with the blue tracer. He'd also previously had radioactive tracer injected into the lid. And that's how we kind of mapped out this, the lymph nodes. But then this gives you further sort of positive visual identification when you're removing them. So we got him close together. This time, you know, we're taking, you know, Three quarters of his lid is almost gone at this point. So we did a superior canthotomy cantholysis to let us slide the lid over. Um, and luckily, everything returns as no evidence of malignancy. So the tarsus is clean. The lymph nodes are clean. Every single map biopsy is clean. And in addition, there's no residual CIN. So where it was present when we took the first wedge, now it's completely cleared. And this is about a, a week and a half afterwards. So he's, he's doing pretty well you can still see the methylene blue kind of discoloring everything. 
All right, and now, so this is where I kind of want to turn over for, to discussion. And, you know, what do we do at this point now? Um, the literature is, is pretty varied on the proper treatment at this point. So the fact that he has the CIN, that by definition is pagetoid spread of sebaceous cell carcinoma, which is why this is such a sort of devastating disease. It's hard to treat because you know, we had Dr. Mamelis look at this, and he te and that's CIN, that's not sebaceous cell, that's, that's CIN, and if you don't have a sebaceous cell under it, you have no idea. And so, if he didn't regrow a calasian and we said, that's CIN, we, we let it go, and then he comes back six months later, and it's, and it's in his orbit. Um, so just, you know, we, we got him sent up to, uh, we'll skip through all of that. So what we did with him, So we sent him to medical oncology, who said, I really don't have anything great to offer. Talk to radiation oncology, although we, I'm not planning to do any of that. Um, and then the third thing that came up is <coughs> there's the syndrome called Mirtor syndrome, which is any sebaceous cell kind of cancer that's associated with other visceral internal malignancies, specifically colon cancer and GU cancers. So he's getting a colonoscopy next week. Um, and at this point, I'm just kind of letting that lid heal, and then we're going to have to kind of play it by ear. Um, so, you know, old school was sebaceous cell, exenerate, and hope for the best. Even with that, there's a 30% kind of recurrence. The overall mort mortality for this guy, even with catching it at this stage, he still has a 22 to 25% chance of losing his life from it. Um, so the role of topical anti-metabolites, there's been several papers where you can treat the pagetoid spread of sebaceous cell with like topical mitomycin C. Uh, the problem with this guy is that now his lid has been so shortened. First, we need to allow the lid to fully heal. And then second, we need to make sure that he still has good enough lid function to be able to protect the eye because the, the mitomycin C is going to tear his eye up. So any any thoughts from anybody? Yeah. It yeah. There's a like about a fifty percent chance of having Muir-Torr syndrome, and so yeah, um, I think you should. Yeah. Yes, Doctor Ambar. That's and that's what I need to see how his eyes doing and and talk to some people because I don't know how much he's going to be able to tolerate. I was hoping to be able to do, you know, sort of stage or sparing, but the other thing is... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is I don't, it, you know, and the reason I'm even doing that is, you know, all of our MAP biopsies are clean and our margins are clean, but that doesn't mean that one millimeter over from where I took a biopsy, there isn't some. And so this is kind of trying to just blanket treat everything. And so I, there is no really good evidence on how to treat this when a lid's been involved and you're trying to, to spare the orbit. Uh, and so I, when he's healed, I'm going to get cornea involved and, yeah. you know, ask for their help. But, yeah, I'd like to be able to do some yeah, sparing. Yes, yeah, so he's, been, he's been scanned. Um, his head and neck are clean. There are some concerning nodes in his lungs which are being looked at, but that would be an unusual kind of skip. Um, <coughs> yeah, so he's getting the full the full workup from it. And, and this is really unusual. Sebaceous cell carcinoma should be in a 65-year-old Asian woman, not a 45-year-old white guy with no medical history. You know, if you see it in younger people, you have to think about prior radiation to the face. But this is pretty unusual situation for a guy that young and healthy. Yeah, and it's unfortunate that he's that young and still has that high of a mortality risk. And he obviously doesn't want an exoneration at this age, and, and there's nothing that's forcing me to do that at this point. Yeah. And They're all clean. All clean. Yeah. Yeah, we got all of them out of there. You know, with the radioactive trace, so there was, we got all of the lymph nodes out of that. There's no, no further radioactive activity. Yeah. 
So we're just kind of in, in this pattern where we're just kind of hoping for the best for this guy. Hopefully his eye can tolerate some degree of mitomycin C. He'll, yeah, we'll be getting yeah, two month MRIs to make sure that the orbit stays clean. Yeah. Any questions? All right, thanks guys. Yeah.